Well, hello everyone, I'm gonna get started. I'm Associate Professor Shelley Kennedy at the University of Georgia's College of Environment and Design. And I'd like to welcome you to um, this installation of our faculty lecture series. Um, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to especially thank and welcome any fellow veterans out there and wish you a happy Veterans Day. Oh, and also I'd like to thank Tom Jones who um, sets our webinars up. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I teach landscape architect architecture courses here at the CED, uh, but I also offer an elective class called Landscapes in Literature, the Arts and Popular Culture, um, which takes a look at representations of the landscapes and their roles and meanings um, across various media and cultures and time periods. And by the way, students, um, you students here at UGA, um, you're welcome to take this class. It's open to everyone from freshmen all the way to graduate students and it satisfies UGA's core four requirements. In the spirit of UGA's Spotlight on the Arts Festival, I thought I'd share a topic from this class appropriate to the fall season and I'm calling it Delicious Terror, Gothic Landscapes in Literature, the Arts and Popular Culture. And FYI, I did record it yesterday uh, because I worked in some YouTube videos and I didn't wanna risk pushing the wrong buttons while we were live. So I hope you enjoy it. I'll be here to respond to your questions. If you put them in the chat, um, I'll, I'll respond to them when the recorded bit is finished. So here we go. As I walked the green miles of the undercliff, there came a change of air. The dense undergrowth was obscenely verdant. And now and then I'd burst out and find I, I stood at the cliff's edge overlooking the sands of Golden Cat. It was impossible to imagine any other human setting foot where I'd set mine. When the path sank into a darker place and I found myself among the ruins of a great house, I shivered as if I'd grown cold. A high pale stone wall with windows pointed at the upper edge put a black shadow at my feet and fragments of its foundation were scattered about like broken teeth. A little further on, I could see the wet black lip of a well. There was a thick silence. All that day I'd seen seabirds wheeling overhead, but in the ruins, nothing but a magpie picked aimlessly at the dust. Brambles put out creepers that caught my ankles as I passed and scraps of cloud passing the empty windows had the appearance of blind faces mouthing at me. What had been a day of brightness and beauty altered all at once. I felt inexplicably anxious as if all those broken stones were conveying to me the memory of something dreadful they'd once witnessed. I stood there a while. What I felt was not quite fear, but a disquieting thrill. That passage was from an essay by Sarah Perry called A Sublime Contagion. And there were several narrative landscape elements in it. Um, it had a rem remote location, it had ruins of a great house, and there was just the lonely narrator and no other people. It used pictorial images of the landscape like the path sank into a darker place, a pale stone wall and fragments scattered like broken teeth. And then nature also conspired to make the scene even more unnerving with its thick silence and the moving clouds that made the windows seem like faces and the brambles sending out creepers to trip up the narrator. The description of this landscape is used to evoke tension and mood, a transition from beauty to sublimity and the titillating thrill of finding yourself alone with a vague feeling of threat in a decaying place with an embodied story. And that's the epitome of a Gothic landscape. The term Gothic conjures up images of isolated castles and graveyards and treacherous and atmospheric landscapes and sometimes even violent storms, certainly darkness and also other unsettling elements in the setting. Gothic narratives involve the supernatural or at least the pretense or promise of the supernatural in the minds of the protagonists. And a Gothic narrative will take its protagonists um, usually into isolated or treacherous places that are steeped in the past. Uh, the emergence of the Gothic and popular culture had a clear beginning in the 18th century um, when the term Gothic was assigned to that era of literature and its accompanying revivalist trend in architecture. And that um, lasted throughout the 19th century. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, there are trends in the visual arts that Though they weren't labeled as Gothic, they both inspired and expressed the mood and the themes and the aesthetics of Gothic that were to come. And both the literary and, literary and architectural movements were characterized by a return to medieval aesthetics. And while the architectural revival has faded, 
Gothic literature and other media continue to be popular even to today with a surprising consistency in the importance and aesthetics of its landscapes. Uh, to understand the potency of the Gothic, it's useful to think of the word as having gone viral. And like a virus, it's shifted and mutated across the centuries to adapt to changing human anxieties and sometimes new formats. Um, so what accounts for its staying power and its this wild popularity? When I say wild popularity, I can give you some pretty easy examples like the Harry Potter novels or countless horror films and TV shows, including Game of Thrones, video games like Elder Scrolls or the World of Warcraft, um, or even our widespread cultural participation in Halloween or going to haunted houses for entertainment. One explanation for its popularity is that being a consumer of Gothic media allows us to virtually dabble in scenarios that might appeal to our darker impulses, but um, that assumes that the reader or viewer identifies more with the antagonist than the protagonist, which I don't think is usually the case. I think it's actually more that we experience the heightened emotions of fascination with what Freud called the unheimlich or the eerie and what Sarah Perry called a disquieting thrill and what I called delicious terror in the title of this lecture. Basically, it's fun to be scared and then to overcome what scares us, kind of like the feeling that we get at the end of a thrill ride at a theme park. And the emotions involve our whole bodies as we get goosebumps and our bowels churn and our hearts race. And these feelings are a lot like feelings of excitement from happier stimuli. So I think it actually makes sense that we enjoy them in the knowledge that it's just entertainment. Um, so I talk about the connection between landscapes and the Gothic. If I'd asked you to visualize a Gothic landscape, even before I described it a minute ago, I bet you would have all imagined something similar in your mind. And that's because there are um, consistencies in the aesthetics and the content of Gothic landscapes running throughout literature and films and other media. And those consistencies come from a finite set of influences and have been successful in how they evoke the desired um, atmosphere or emotions or anxieties in readers or viewers. So it's like there's a set of rules within which Gothic landscapes are constructed. And in a minute, I'll talk about the philosophical and popular origins of these ascetic rules and themes, but there's more basic reason really to focus on landscapes when discussing the Gothic. And that's because place is perhaps the most critically important element in a Gothic narrative. Um, so go back to your mental image of a Gothic landscape. Chances are it's dark and mysterious and includes a building set in a remote and maybe even dangerous landscape. And also nature and the weather are probably conspiring to make it even more atmospheric or threatening. And I bet the building you visualize probably isn't any old building, like it's probably not a duplex or a, a brick ranch. Um, you know, it's more than likely a castle, like in Bram Stoker's Dracula, or maybe a manor house, like in Henry James's novel, The Turn of the Screw, or maybe a dark, dark tower or Hogwarts or an abbey or some other similar place that represents institutional or individual power. And these buildings that you visualize probably show their age in a state of decay or disuse or even ruin. And it's this confluence of age and the representation of power and decay in the landscape that make it Gothic. Without a narrative rooted in a specific place that has these three factors, a scary story isn't Gothic. Um, so in the Gothic, place is used as a device to not only provide um, atmospheric or isolated settings, but through their link to the past and their state of decay, they provide the elements that point out certain social or psychological anxieties of corruption or abuse. And then as crumbling places of power, they actually represent an inversion or perversion of the power structures of the patriarchy or the aristocracy or the church or even a local figure of authority. So in other words, um, what Gothic works are doing with Gothic place as its literary or its visual devices to critique these places of power as places of destruction instead of order, or of order masking ruin, and by extension, the owners and inhabitants of these places are in a state of moral decay or ruin. Um, and think about it, the world's most famous vampire, Dracula, um, who lived in this Gothic landscape, um, in both the novel and supposedly in real life, he wasn't just Hans the farmhand. You know, he was based on an ancient European ruler who was so cruel and corrupt that he tortured and killed guests at his dinner parties. And the Dracula story plays on a number of cultural fears, like the fear of death or being imprisoned or raped or otherwise having having no power or control over your destiny in, a, in maybe a feudal or a hierarchical or patriarchal society. And his landscape settings are used to heighten and dramatize these fears with their darkness and their isolation and the perilous 
cliffs and weather and the representation of decay. And in fact, the role of landscape and place in the Gothic is so strong that it sometimes overshadows the human characters and actually becomes a character in itself and a catalyst for the action that takes place in the narrative. Also, the supernatural elements in Gothic narratives are um, intimately linked with the use of place to the extent that horror and the supernatural become indicators of the invisible energy that's embodied in a decaying or corrupted seat of power. Now I'd like to get into the philosophical and the cultural roots of the Gothic aesthetic, which really took hold in the 18th century. But I need to preface that discussion by first looking at some really popular painting styles of the 17th century. And I'm going to keep it simple by focusing on the work of these two painters, Claude Laurent and Salvatore Rosa, um, though there were others. Uh, their paintings are not Gothic in category, especially Laurent's weren't, um, but they depicted landscapes and nature as a powerful subject rather than just a background, and with elements of composition that became codified as evoking intrinsic emotional reactions. Um, Claude Laurent was a French painter who spent most of his life in Italy, and his landscapes usually represented scenes from the Bible or classical mythology um, placed within fictional landscapes, and he modeled his buildings on existing Renaissance and Baroque architecture that he saw that were generally in a classical style, and then he placed them in idyllic and pastoral countrysides. Whereas Salvatore Rosa was an Italian painter, um, and he was described as unorthodox and sometimes extravagant, and his landscape paintings were more brooding and melancholy and stormy, and, and they often included frightening characters like witches and bandits, and the architecture in his paintings was more medieval and often in ruins. And it's important to know that the work of both of these artists and others of their ilk was extremely pop popular in Europe at that time to the extent that they were the, actually the catalyst for tourism to places with similar landscapes. And also the inspiration for the landscape design of English estates. Um, the styles evoked emotional responses of calm and delight in the case of Laurent and titillating fear or revulsion or even awe in the case of Rosa's paintings. And the consistencies in form and depiction of content that evoked these emotional reactions was expressed in the terms, the beautiful and the sublime, um, which were then, those terms were codified by an aesthetician of the time, um, Edmund Burke, who theorized the viewer's emotional responses to these aesthetic values were instinctive. Um, Burke's concept of the beautiful and the sublime in system of landscape aesthetics actually became a common cultural reference after he published his treatise on aesthetics that was titled A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Ideas of the Beautiful and Sublime. And he published that in 1757. Um, in this treatise, he theorized that the beautiful was that which is well-formed and aesthetically pleasing, whereas the sublime is that which has the power to compel and, and destroy us. Um, in Burke's philosophy, philosophical inquiry, uh, didn't expressly deal with the Gothic, um, but by linking aesthetics to intense and instinctual emotional states, it had a profound effect on the development of the literary Gothic. Um, to Burke, the beautiful and sublime were mutually exclusive, uh, where an appreciation of a beautiful object inspires sentiments of tenderness and affection, which he um, wrote was a reasoned aesthetic response characterized by joy and pleasure uh, you know, and then he compared that to the sublime. Um, when one encountered the sublime, he felt that the viewer lost all reason and all joy. And he stated that the terror associated with the sublime was also to be appreciated because nature isn't only connected to splendor, but it's also connected to astonishment and even horror. Um, he wrote that, uh, and this is a quote, dark, confused, uncertain images have a greater power on the fancy to form the grander passions than those which are more clear and determinate, unquote. Uh, and that's because in darkness, a person is unable to discern the full scope of potentially dangerous things in the scene. Uh, nevertheless, while the beautiful and the sublime are characterized as mutually exclusive, Burke stated that they both produce pleasure in the observer. In beauty, the pleasure uh, was of seeing the beautiful and in sublimity, the pleasure was of escaping from that sense of horror when it's over. And I'll try to simplify. Um, here's a simple summary of the beautiful with a pretty good example um, in this painting by Claude Laurent. Um, paintings that characterized that were characterized by being beautiful um, usually included, if they're landforms, uh, 
if there were lands forms included, they were typically small. Um, forms were typically smooth and rounded. You see in the architecture here, it's kind of polished and not in a ruined state and the colors are delicate and there's sunlight on the scene and fluffy clouds. Um, and these paintings in the beautiful are associated with clarity and light and pleasures such as um, love and complacency. Um, and here's a basic summary of the sublime. Um, here you see two paintings by Salvatore Rosa, where the landscapes are darker. In the one on the right, it's much more overwhelming and the landforms are large and they're very jagged and rugged and dangerous. Um, you see that the clouds certainly aren't fluffy and bright. Uh, they're dark and threatening. Um, and, you know, parts of the scene are obscured and the emotions these are associated with irreverence reverence and awe and anxiety and horror. Uh, by the way, this reflected the common fears of the time, which included bandits and wild men or other social outcasts if you were a person who was traveling or being dashed to pieces at sea or otherwise endangered by terrain or supernatural forces. The conversation about the beautiful and sublime expanded when Sir Uvedale Price wrote this essay on the picturesque as compared, as, excuse me, as compared to the sublime and the beautiful in 1794. And because he and other aesthetes of the day felt that there should be another category for landscapes that bridge the beautiful and the sublime, and they called it the picturesque. Um, Price thought of the picturesque as less polished, symmetrical, and classical, but also not dangerous, frightening, or, or awe-inspiringly vast. And if interpreted, interpreted in landscape design, um, the picturesque might include such things as older trees that were less fluffy, um, rutted paths and textured slopes, but in a non-threatening and a comprehensible scene with like an attractive rusticity. Or in a painting, elements of the beautiful and the sublime could both be balanced, included but balanced for a picturesque effect. Um, for example, by showing a dark ruined building on a jagged peak, but by putting a ray of sunlight uh, on it to illuminate it. A little bit later in the 19th century, William Gilpin came along and he furthered the popularity of this concept of the picturesque in his essay on prints. Um, he was also the writer and illustrator of several extremely popular domestic British travel books because he managed to publish them at exactly the right time when there were improved road conditions in Britain and also travel restrictions on continental Europe. And that caused an explosion of British domestic tourism. Um, and at this time, tourists liked to visit and sketch places well known from books and paintings. And Gilpin wrote his work specifically for that market. On this slide, you can see one of Gilpin's book illustrations showing a picturesque landscape with recognizable elements from both the beautiful and the sublime. Uh, for the beautiful, you can see the fluffy rounded trees and for the sublime, there's the sharp crest of a large mountain in the background, but it's made non-threatening or less threatening by being well lit by the sun. And also there's attractively rustic touches like um, the ruts in the road. It's important here to reiterate that these described conventions of landscape aesthetics, the beautiful, the sublime, and the picturesque, they became a really common cultural reference throughout Great Britain and Europe and also North America. And to point out the consumption of illustrated travel books and of landscape paintings and drawings at the time constituted kind of virtual tourism. Um, and at this point, I think I need to place these three aesthetic conventions in the context of a greater philosophical trend or trends that influenced them and paved the way for the Gothic. And that would be the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Um, because it's important to know that in the era of Romanticism, British novelists were starting to make use of these landscape aesthetic conventions to add layers of emotional content and to draw readers through their stories, which is the foundation for the development of Gothic literature. Um, the Enlightenment, of course, was also known as, known as the Age of Reason. That was the intellectual and philosophical movement that dominated Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries following the scientific revolution. And the ideals of the Enlightenment valued reason and scientific method and the evidence of the senses as the primary sources of knowledge as opposed to emotion or religion. And in its associated built environment, classicism was considered the rational model of beauty. And then romanticism developed during the end of the 18th century and held its ground in the, into the 19th century as an artistic and intellectual backlash of sorts to the Enlightenment and also a backlash to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and the emphasis of romanticism was more on emotion and spiritualism and imagination 
and its expressions in various media, um, sort of glorified nature in the past. And in aesthetics, it leaned toward the medieval rather than the classical, which of course leans more towards the aesthetics of the sublime. And there was a cultural preference for the sublime over the beautiful in the Romantic era. Um, because as Romanticism took hold in popular culture, there was a new emphasis on emotions like apprehension and horror and terror and awe, um, especially when people were confronted by the sublimity of nature in real life or in paintings, like the paintings shown here by Moran or in literature. Um, and awe and darkness and the mystery of the wild um, in nature provided conditions for suspense and other heightened emotions in the reader or viewer, um, which again was at opposition with the Enlightenment's more scientific rationalization of nature. Um, and as authors began to abandon the Enlightenment's rationality and reason in favor of exploring the pleasure that can be found in emotions like terror, the settings of their stories rejected classical beauty and started to call on the vaguely medieval past whose physical remains were things like Gothic, Gothic castles and abbeys and ruins. Um, Horace Walpole wrote the first Gothic novel and it was called The Castle of Otranto and that was published in 1764. And Walpole first applied the word Gothic to a novel in the subtitle of this one. Uh, subtitle is actually a Gothic story. Um, and when he used this word, it meant something like barbarous as well as deriving from the Middle Age. And it's actually something of a joke um, or maybe Walpole was kind of a drama queen because he actually pretended that the story itself was an antique relic and wrote a preference in which the translator claims to have discovered the tale in an ancient library. Um, the novel itself was set in the interior of its namesake castle rather than the, in the landscape, um, but it did provide an archetype for the confluence of place and power and ruin that later Gothic authors make use of. Um, in, in addition to being a writer, Walpole was an art historian and an antiquarian. Um, and he not only wrote the first Gothic novel, but he inspired a Gothic revival in architecture when he built his home called Strawberry Hill, which was one of the most influential buildings in its day. Um, and to him, both his novel and his home were meant to be titillating experiences. And both of them drew inspiration from the past and from old things, which he was a collector of. After the Castle of Otranto was published, uh, the popularity of Gothic literature spread quickly and we see the publishing of these two novels, The Monk and Melmoth the Wanderer. And these novels were actually pretty lurid and grotesque and almost shock horror in their day rather than a suspense novel. Um, and they also were not focused on the landscape. Uh, but that trend very quickly changed when Anne Radcliffe came on the scene and made use of the beautiful and the picturesque and the sublime as literary devices to move her plots forward. And from then on, the landscape became the most important feature in Gothic literature, and then by extension in the future of Gothic media like film and TV and video games. In the 1790s, Anne Radcliffe became a, just an absolute publishing phenomenon. And in fact, she was the most read novelist of her time and the most translated and, and also the most imitated. And because of her popularity, it was Radcliffe who really codified most of the characteristics that define Gothic narratives to this day. All of her novels are set in foreign places and they all have really lengthy descriptions of sublime scenery interspersed with scenery that's beautiful and, and picturesque. And she actually derived her settings from those travel books and paintings that I had mentioned. One of the most unique aspects of Radcliffe's novels is that strong emphasis on landscape, so much so that critics have named her style a pictorial art. It was like she painted scenes of words that engaged those three popular conventions of a landscape. And she did it in such vivid detail that they mentally evoked dreamy and beautiful or picturesque scenes um, like those in the paintings of Claude Laurent or the sublime scenes of treacherous cliffs and darkness and menacing characters like in Rosa's paintings. And remember that her readers would have known these visual references really well. And then she used the rhythm of going back and forth between the three landscape conventions to set up uh, a building of tension and dread and anticipation of horrors to come in her narratives. And this sense of dread was actually the point of these novels and it's what made them deliciously thrilling. But her use of the picturesque and the beautiful provided a necessary, necessary emotional relief from the dread and then heightened it by contrast. And it's this rhythmic interplay between these landscape conventions that became the model for the narrative construction of just about all Gothic media um, to the present. 
And let me show you an example of how Radcliffe builds apprehension with landscape using conventions of the sublime. Um, and in, in this example, by focusing on the quality of light and levels of, of obscurity um, in the views that she's writing about. And um, these quotes are from the chapter of the mysteries of Udolfo, um, where the main character, Emily, is actually approaching Udolfo Castle, which is situated high in the Apennine Mountains. So the first quote is, as she's approaching, as she gazed, the light died away on the castle's walls, leaving it a melancholy purple tint, which spread deeper and deeper as the thin vapor crept up the mountain, while the battlements above were still tipped with splendor. So that was a bit picturesque, but we get to the next quote, which is, as the twilight deepened, its features became more awful in its obscurity. And you see that movement into the sublime there. Radcliffe also used the landscape to set up parallels between landscapes and characters. And she did this in more than one way. Um, first, the journeys that her characters made through the landscapes were sort of parallel journeys through their different emotional states. But then she also used characters' reactions to the landscape um, as indicators of their moral, moral character. Um, for example, if a character felt emotionally moved by the objects of nature or the quality of light or by a beautiful unfolding vista, they were more likely to be good characters um, in the story. Or to put it more simply, if a character was written as appreciating beauty in the landscape, that character had the high moral ground, whereas characters who either didn't care or didn't notice beautiful landscapes were um, ended up being like the morally questionable or even corrupt characters in her stories. And then further, um, theories of landscape were tied to particular settings, particularly if they're residences. Uh, the more morally upstanding of Radcliffe's characters tended to dwell in settings that were beautiful and idyllic, whereas her corrupt characters were based in settings that were sublimely lonely and desolate and ruinous sometimes. And getting back to the essence of the Gothic that I discussed earlier, that Gothic place in these novels takes on aspects of its owner, um, which is invariably somebody with a crumbling or corrupt degree of power. And here's another interesting thing that the landscape does in Radcliffe's novels. It frustrates the linearity of time and kind of sets up a dreamlike quality in the narrative. And because as her characters travel from place to place, um, you'll read uh, descriptions of views of ruins that are so sort of woven in and out of the narrative, and that in turn kind of weave the past into and out of the present um, as the narrative goes on. And the line linearity of time is further confused by the novel's nearly total absence of references to days of the week or months or seasons. And so this overall effect sort of has a layering it kind of has the effect of a layering of the temporal and the spatial, um, especially when the main character reaches Udolfo Castle, where in its crumbling state, its spaces feel sort of electrically charged with whispers or consequences of the past. And this helps to give Radcliffe's novels that mood and tension of the supernatural, but a spoiler alert, if you haven't read any of them, is that her narratives are more about the fear of the supernatural than actually about the supernatural itself. Uh, now let's take a look at what's been developing in the visual arts in the Romantic and Gothic era in Europe. And I'll start with William Blake, who's thought of primarily as an author, mostly of poetry, but who also painted loads of creepy illustrations for his books like these, which are actually illustrations for the Book of Revelation. Um, and I'll point out here that he was considered a little bit insane by many of the, his contemporaries, but they nonetheless admired him for his philosophical and mystical underpinnings in his work. Um, and Blake didn't focus on landscapes in his paintings, but this shows you the intense expressiveness and taste for the dramatic and terrifying that characterized the Romantic movement. And now I'll move on to Francisco Goya, who I'm sure most of you have heard of. Um, you may not know his black paintings though. Um, these were actually 14 murals that he painted on the interior walls of his house and he never intended them for public viewing, which kind of gives us a good a glimpse into his psyche, I think. They portray intensely emotional and haunting themes that speak to his apparent fear of insanity and um, his embittered attitude toward humanity after years and years of war in Europe. Um, and after his death, these murals were somehow transferred to canvas and became very well known, especially the one on the right, Saturn devouring his son. I mean, really, because how could a painting like that not become a sensation? So let's take a good look at uh, Saturn devouring his son. And remember that Romanticism was anti-classical. So in this painting, we can see that the figure of Saturn's son is classical in form of proportion, also kind of odd in its maturity, 
whereas Saturn himself is grotesque and misshapen. So it, it almost seems as though Goya is literally depicting the past devouring classicism. And then we get to Caspar David Friedrich, who was one of the most important German painters of his time. And he actually brings a, you know, he brings the sublime of the natural world and anti-classicism of romanticism into his landscape paintings with a clear Gothic aesthetic at this point. And his paintings show the relationship of man and nature subjectively and emotionally, and he used natural elements symbolically. For example, he used bare oak trees and, and like tree stumps in his paintings to symbolize death, which you don't see here, but you will see in a couple of slides. Um, in this painting, you see the sublime more in the vastness and obscurity of the distance and in the dark mood of the color palette. Um, because he, Friedrich was so successful in portraying that dramatic emotional quality in his paintings, his work was admired and became influential again in the late 19th and early 20th century in the expressionist and surrealist and ex existentialist movements. And here's an example of an expressionist painting from uh, the late 19th century. It's quite different in its material subject from Friedrich's Monk by the Sea that we just looked at, um, but it's similar in its use of dark colors and dim lighting and that odd distillation of the human form to create a slightly scary and emotionally bleak feeling. Um, so looking at more of Friedrich's works, um, in these drawings of his, you can see human fears set up in a very literal way, like uh, the one on the left. If you look closely, the plants look kind of toxic and there's a spider hovering over the woman's head and, you know, we're all afraid of spiders. And in both of them, you see that symbolism of death in the dead tree forms. Um, in the trees here in these paintings, uh, you see they're very directional and their forms are agitated and they, they kind of take on the quality of characters in the narrative of the paintings. In fact, on that painting on the left, the tree is clearly focused towards the humans in an almost threatening posture. And this is the granddaddy of all Gothic paintings. Um, this is Friedrich's famous Abbey in the Oakwood. And it, you see it's a macabre scene in which monks carry a coffin past an open grave uh, through a portal of a ruined abbey. Um, and again, here we see the symbolism of death in the trees. And this type of symbolism pretends another trend in the Gothic, which is where nature itself becomes an active source of terror. So I talked about the importance of place in the physical character of landscapes in the Gothic, but creators of Gothic media have also used this other aspect of the landscape as a narrative device. Again, it's natural forces especially weather phenomenon or seasonality or time of day, in particular dusk or nighttime. And these forces of nature are used to indicate impending danger or to heighten tension and anxiety um, in both the protagonist, but also the, the reader or viewer. And in this way, nature becomes a supplement for the real source of terror. And sometimes this is taken further and nature becomes a conspirator or an antagonist, like when a violent storm descends at a certain point in the narrative or when a character becomes lost in a murky forest or cut off from their senses when they're maybe surrounded by fog or when maybe they become entangled in vegetation as though it was intentional on uh, the part of the vegetation. This use of nature was prevalent in American Gothic literature. Um, perhaps maybe that was because Eurocentric America didn't have those centuries old ruins, but it did have an abundance of sublime vastness in you know, our ancient wildernesses in which we um, could place our fears and anxieties. Um, I'll talk about some of these um, classics of American literature. In the fall of the House of Usher, Edgar Allan Poe constructed a, he was a pretty classic Gothic landscape with a decaying mansion in a bleak setting. But the story begins with the main character's depression, mental depression brought about by the melancholy of an autumn day in which, quote, the clouds hung oppressively low, unquote. And then soon afterwards, he notices that in the landscape, there actually hung kind of a visible atmosphere, which had sort of um, reeked up from the decaying trees. Um, and this is a quote, reeked up from the decaying trees, the gray wall and the silent lake, unquote. And then in that story, natural forces continue to feed the tension and supplement the final disaster at the end of the story when a violent storm and then uh, a whirlwind, which actually sounded more like a tornado, bring about the total collapse of the house and, while a blood red moon illuminated the scene. Um, in the American Gothic, sometimes characters are actually driven to madness by nature. Um, 
in Dana's novel called Paul Felton, the narrator describes a scene where the character of Abel enters the woods and a storm immediately starts to bruise, though the wind and rain were, quote, malignant spirits of the air. And, and then the storm actually gets worse and the branches start to hit each other almost as if they're intentionally fighting, which starts to drive that character of Abel mad. And the author uses personification in this scene as if to suggest that nature is sentient and malevolent. Um, and American Gothic writers employed this pattern frequently and a recurring theme is that motif of the woods as a cursed place. Um, again, Paul Felton entering the woods was kind of like crossing the border of what was forbidden and then stepping into madness. Uh, and another American writer, Nathaniel Hawthorne, used the evil forest motif in more than one of his pieces, but the one that stands out is this short story called Young Goodman Brown, um, where the main character's journey is set in the wilderness at night, and the road leads through, uh, quote, all the gloomiest trees of the forest, unquote where the force in the story serves as a sort of conspirator with the devil and where the main character feels that evil watches his every step. Uh, meanwhile, back in England, um, the novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley marked a shift in Gothic horror by changing the typical Gothic, Gothic villain from an evil man or a supernatural force into an actual physical embodiment of human degradation brought to life through science. And in fact, Frankenstein is considered kind of the link between Gothic horror and science fiction because Shelley used existing scientific precedent and extended it into fictional speculation. Um, and the scientific inspiration for Frankenstein was actually the experiments of Luigi Galvini in 1786 when he animated the desiccated, or the, excuse me, the dissected frogs, <sighs> the dissected legs of a frog. Um, he did that through the application of electricity. And then in 1805, his nephew, applied electrical stimulation to the corpse of a hanged human who was a murderer um, and managed to animate it in several places, making it, he made its jaw quiver and its eye open, and he made its legs move and twitch and made its right hand actually raise and clench. And this was the direct inspiration for Frankenstein and the reason that it can be classified not just as Gothic, but as proto -science, uh, science fiction. And meanwhile, um, the Gothic had become so influential that it crept into more mainstream Victorian fiction uh, in the mid 19th century in Britain. Um, both Emily and Charlotte Bronte hinted of the supernatural within narratives that were otherwise fairly rooted more realistically in time and place. Um, in Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre, those storylines were each centered on houses that had a feeling of being haunted uh, by making use of the Gothic idea that entering an old building means entering the stories of or being oppressed by those who had lived there before. And in both cases, like in Radcliffe's novels, there ended up being rational cases for the mysteries and fears raised in these novels, but uh, the Gothic motifs still provided that vocabulary of apprehensiveness through their use of decaying structures set in atmospheric and isolated landscapes. Um, in fact, this for Victorian era, produced some of the most well-known examples of Gothic horror uh, with the publication of novels like The Woman in White and Dracula and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and The Turn of the Screw. And some new cultural fears are being explored at this point um, as they were in Frankenstein. Uh, for example, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, it kind of plays on uh, society's post-Darwinian anxieties at the time as in, you know, where does man end and animal nature begin. And then in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the themes that were exploited by Robert Louis Stevenson played on the Victorian era's class divisions and the fundamental dichotomy of an outward respectability versus an inward um, lust. And it's also interesting in its urban setting where the sublime is expressed as the seedy and dark part of town while the beautiful is expressed more in the more well-to-do areas. Um, and this was probably directly inspired by Stevenson's having been born in Edinburgh, um, which has a really old medieval section that historically was inhabited and very crowded uh, by the city's poor. Um, and it had really dark crime ridden slums, as opposed to its more modern Georgian parts uh, of this of Edinburgh with their wide spacious streets that represented respectability. And Dickens also used the urban landscape to represent new fears in a Gothic way. Um, though his tales did, you know, sometimes include settings outside the city, but um, in Oliver, Oliver Twist and A Christmas Carol, they make use of urban settings um, 
and also grim and squalid kind of industrial landscapes. And in Bleak House, um, Dickens describes London as surreal and nightmarish. And some of the descriptive phrases he uses were, uh, it's street or streets are nothing but mud. The slums are shadowy and silent. Soot from chimneys falls like rain and everything is cloaked in fog. And then when you get to um, that novel's other setting, uh, the Deadlock Estate, the mansion itself is actually Gothic in style and the river that it overlooks is stagnant. And there's even a hint of the supernatural in the form of the ghost walk, which is a stretch of pavement outside the mansion on which ghostly footsteps can sometimes be heard. And I'm sure as most of you know, Dickens novels were really heavy on social criticism. And it's obvious that the new social anxieties he exploits for his Gothic narratives are extremes of class distinction. And again, the overcrowding and mortally squalid conditions of cities at the time, which were a direct result from the industrial revolution. And among, another motif we see that's brought into the Gothic aesthetic by the industrial revolution is that of industrial materials, especially heavy metals. Um, and think of the term heavy metal in modern music and that style's frequent association with dark and Gothic themes. And with that, I thought I'd bring us right into the modern day briefly with a video clip that shows the Gothic metal aesthetic uh, in the video game World of Warcraft Shadowlands. So I will, and I'm gonna go to a video now. The Jailer of the Damned. A grim task, which I have failed. Now the Eternal Veil screams, torn asunder by her. Within the realm of shadow lies the darkest of terrors which should never be set free. The Shadowlands are infinite. Their terrors and beauty were never meant for mortal eyes. I wonder if they can bear to behold all that awaits them. In that video, we saw heavy reliance on metal in both the characters and the sublime landscapes. Uh, even the sky looks metallic. Take a look at this still here from it. Um, we also saw the classic rhythmic interplay between landscapes of the beautiful and the sublime that give the consumers of this media some emotional relief while also increasing the tension throughout, through the vivid contrast. When I jump to that video, I obviously bypassed some history. So let's go back to the 20th century now and um, look at how the genre continued in media from then through to today. Um, in the 20th and 21st centuries, we still see the same aesthetic principles at work, but with some newer forms of expression, like being expressed in post-industrial ruins or post-apocalyptic ruins and landscapes, or even cold and personal cities with jagged skylines, um, in it, which brings Gotham City to mind. And in the modern era, we also see Gothic narratives expressed in new forms of media like film and TV and comic books and video games and I don't know, probably some others that I've forgotten. Um, let's look at this image here. I love this image. It's Batman in Gotham City. And you obviously, and, and obviously even the name of Gotham City derives from the word Gothic. Um, you can even see Batman in a pose that directly mimics a gargoyle on a medieval cathedral. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, you know, film was the obvious inheritor of the Gothic because the pictorial tradition of Gothic literature made it easy to adapt their stories to this new visual art form. And as a film genre, uh, Gothic horror was quite popular during the early days of cinema and, and continues to be so today. So there are really far too many Gothic horror films to list. Um, here we see a still from S Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow in 1999. And this image should remind you of the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich and how he depicted trees to symbolize death. Um, of course, there's also too many novels and authors from the modern era to list, but I'll name a few. Um, there's Daphne du Maurier. Um, there's the Twilight novels of Stephanie Meyer, 
or the novels of Anne Rice um, or Stephen King. There's the Harry Potter series um, and the Lord of the Rings novels by Tolkien even incorporate Gothic landscapes into their narratives. Uh, with TV, the situation's the same. There's just so many, you can't really list them all. Um, there are even, you know, Gothic themed TV shows produced for children. Um, really the sort of the granddaddy of all Gothic TV shows is that old soap opera called Dark Shadows that aired from 1966 through 71. And pretty much any of us who were alive back in those days were mesmerized by um, the producer's atmospheric use of the sublime in this show and its gruesome and, and even sexually charged terrors. Then uh, moving on to video games. Um, video games have really taken the 18th century landscape aesthetic conventions and the Gothic and use them extremely effectively to draw players into the storyline and to add emotional complexity to the experience. Um, in them, you know, the aesthetic conventions of the beautiful and the sublime and the picturesque, they're relied upon in the same ways that they were in novels and in films to move plot. And in a terror-filled survival game, the picturesque can actually provide opportunities for breaks from the horror. And I'm gonna go to another video at this point. Elder Scrolls Online, everything you need to know about it is right in the name. It's Elder Scrolls, but it's online. And when the team set out, they wanted to create strategic real-time combat. We wanted to create a lot of world immersion. We wanted to create a, a landscape that was rewarded exploration. But all of that had to be brought together with really great social systems. So Elder Scrolls Online, it's set a thousand years before Skyrim. And not only is it a thousand years before Skyrim, but it draws on all the legends and everything that you've read about in the books that you find in Elder Scrolls games. So we've got 20 years of lore to draw upon. We made sure that Morrowind, Cyrodiil, and Skyrim feel like they do in Elder Scrolls 3, 4, and 5. The art style is right in line with those titles. Now you can explore all of Tamriel. You can return to places that you've seen before, and you can explore new places that you've never been. So you could really see those changes in landscape that you could characterize as beautiful and picturesque and sublime in that video. Um, and other parallels between the Gothic and video games and in literature and other media are that um, there's a very distinct symbol, symbolic connection between the character of the landscape features and the morals or power of those who control the landscapes. And also they both um, act as a form of virtual tourism which is described in Elder Scrolls video as world immersion. Um, and here's an example of the opportunity for picturesque tourism within the fictional game world. And it's from Fallout, which presents a dystopian version of Washington DC, but offers the opportunity to break from fighting to explore its sort of ruined and picturesque post-industrial uh, landscape. So um, let me take you to that right now. Oh, oh God. 
One more thing about video games is that uh, they provide additional experiences, um, you know, not just virtual tourism or world immersion, as they call it, um, but they provide even more additional experiences that other forms of media can. Um, and these include an actual sense of physical movement by the player through these landscapes. Uh, and then the chance to personally and privately dabble in some darker, darker impulses um, and then also having some personal a, personal agency over the situation and choices, like the choice to escape sublime horrors. You know, video games are very visual. Um, so I'm go back to the visual arts in the modern era. And I'm choosing to highlight the art photography of one person whose work has really deeply narrative and atmospheric qualities. Now I've already inter interspersed several of Killian Schoenberger's photos into this lecture but I'd like to show you a few more because he's a master of capturing the sublime at its Gothic best. Um, and here we see an intensely sublime landscape in all its dark jaggedness. Um, it would clearly be a treacherous landscape to travel through. It has an angry storm brewing that adds a feeling of impending danger. Uh, and here we see the remains of a place that really tell a story of ruin and decay expressed in the materiality of the industrial revolution. And here we see two of his photos that should take your mind directly back to something I showed you earlier from Europe around 1808, that which was that famous Gothic painting by Caspar Friedrich called Abbey in the Oakwood. And I'll just remind you what that looks like here. Um, and in this particular photo of Schoenberger's, I'd also argue that uh, he references not just Abbey in the Oakwood, but also Friedrich's Monk by the Sea in its placement of that one solitary and obscured figure in an overwhelming and mysterious landscape. And in showing these works that take us from 1808 to the present, I'd like to wrap things up. Um, as we've seen, as we've seen uh, Gothic themes and aesthetics have endured since they first became popular in the sublime paintings of Salvatore Rosa and the novels of the Romantic era. And from Anne Radcliffe's novels to today, the presentation and characterization of the Gothic setting has been really remarkably consistent. Um, the Gothic is strongly rooted in landscape and place, and these Gothic places, almost without exception, suffer from aesthetic or political or physical or existential decay, and they give us a way to critique the inherent corruption of the power that was seated there. Um, consuming the Gothic in whatever media also draws on our secret fears and maybe even urges and gives us license to sensations that we wouldn't normally admit while simultaneously placing those sensations into a strange context so that we can think that they actually have nothing to do with us. And in this sense, our consumption of the Gothic gives us that hiding place for our curiosity about what lies beyond the boundary of social norms and reason. Okay, end of lecture.